You know, this message that I'm going to preach today has been <clears throat> done, obviously, for several weeks. This was my Easter Sunday message, um, which I was not able to be here for. And as I've kind of pondered things over the last couple of weeks, I wondered, do I preach that message? I mean, Easter was three weeks ago, right? I mean, we don't need to preach another Easter message, do we? And just kind of the realization that Easter is timeless. And it really doesn't matter if you preach an Easter message on Easter or if you preach it in October. And so we're going to kind of continue where we have been going uh, with this particular series and just kind of see what God has for us today. One of the things that I was reminded um, as we were worshiping today was Elaine and I did a lot of that over the last couple of weeks at home. But it's just not the same. <laughs> you, you, you can sing at home and you can have worship music on at home and, and you can do all those things, but it just isn't the same as when you are with the body of Christ and you are worshiping corporately together. And again, I obviously would encourage you to continue worshiping at home in, in any and all areas and times and so forth, um, but I just kind of realized that even more so this morning, how powerful that is. You know, we've looked at 1 Corinthians 5, 4 on some occasions that, that there is power when we are assembled in the name of Jesus. And so thank you for that. Thank you for all of what you're doing. You know, as we've talked about Easter and we've thought about Easter, um, one of the questions that I was going to have for you on that Easter Sunday is, what's your favorite Easter memory? Um, for me, it's Godfather's Pizza. And, and the reason it's Godfather's Pizza is because our church in Wyoming, we would have about 3,500 people um, on Easter Sunday. And so you had all kinds of Easter buffets at a variety of the hotels and so forth in town and, and restaurants. And we just never really felt like we had the money to do that or with three small children. It just wasn't the thing that you did. And so we started just to go to Godfather's Pizza after Easter services. And there was nobody at Godfather's Pizza on an Easter Sunday, by the way. And it was so cool because we began to gather people to come with us. And, and we gathered our neighbors who really weren't churchgoers. And they would come to Easter services with us. And then we would go to Godfather's Pizza. And then we gathered another family and another family. And it was just so cool. And so my fondest memories of Easter are eating at Godfather's Pizza in Casper, Wyoming uh, with our family and our friends. And we, we had been talking about Passover. And we had been talking about... Um, what the Jews were instructed by God to do. They were instructed, remember, to take that little lamb into the house, and they were going to take that little lamb into the house for five days, and they were going to examine that lamb. That lamb would live with them. And they would sleep with it, they would eat with it, they would play with it. They would basically determine, is this lamb without blemish? Is this lamb perfect? And after that five-day period of time, the dad would kill the lamb and then would spread the blood on the doorposts of the house. And we see it in Exodus 12, kill the lamb at twilight. Now, twilight in the Hebrew calendar and in the clock is about 3 o'clock. Um, they don't do a calendar like we do. Their days basically are different. And so when they say kill it at twilight, it means kill it at 3 o'clock. And God says, when I see the blood... No plague will destroy you. It's a sacrifice to remember when the Lord delivered you. We've talked about that a lot here, that God doesn't want us to remember and focus all of the bad things that have happened to us. Uh, the stuff that Elaine and I went through and others have gone through and others are going through right now, God doesn't want us to focus on that. God wants to focus on how he delivered us from that, whatever that is. And so we focus on God's deliverance. And as you look at this, this picture of Passover and this picture of the perfect lamb being sacrificed, uh, the picture that the plague and the destruction would pass over the Israelites, um, you see what's just a shadow. Um, it, it, it's not reality. 
it, it's a shadow of what was to come. It was a picture for them. It's a picture for us. You know, Romans 15 says these things were written for our learning, not our living. So when we look at the Old Testament and we look at stories in the Old Testament, and we do that here frequently, when we do that, we don't look at those as rules for living. We look at them as rules for learning. How does that help us today under the new covenant? And so this picture, this story that we're going to kind of continue to look at today is a picture of Jesus. Jesus is the reality of this story. And sometimes we talked about this a little bit in our staff and stuff, that I don't necessarily preach a lot about finances or marriage or relationships or so forth. My particular ministry is 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And, and that's my particular ministry. There, there are other pastors, um, and they preach and have maybe a specific um, thought process, a specific emphasis that they preach on. And again, some of them might be relationship experts. Some of them might be relationships on finances uh, or parenting. And, and that's kind of their focus. And, and my focus is I'm just going to preach to Jesus and him crucified. And as I looked at this message several weeks ago, I thought, well, is it really going to change anybody's life? Is, is there really any practical information here? Is there any three or four steps that you're going to walk out of here today and go, man, I can do this, this, and this, and my life will change? I'm not sure. But I do know that in 2 Peter chapter 1, we read that everything required for life and godliness is found in the knowledge of him. So when I preach a message like this to you, that I don't know if I would say it's more historical in nature or whatever, it maybe is less practical than some other messages that I've preached, there is still incredible value in it. Why? Why? Because we're learning about Jesus. And as we're learning about Jesus, everything required for life is found in the knowledge of him. So I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what that burden was that maybe Sam talked about today. I don't know what answers you need. I know they are varied. And there are people over here who have needs that people here don't have, and people over here have some other need. And so in all of those things, what we can see today is that as we find out about who Jesus is, then we're going to find in whatever way that the Holy Spirit has for you and I some kind of transformation as we look at Jesus. We're going to find that thing that we need for life and godliness. Because I, I, could, I could stand up here and preach to you maybe about marriage, or I could preach to you about parenting, and maybe that's not the particular area of life that you're in right now, and you go home and say, well, that really didn't do me much good. But if I preach and unveil Jesus to you, then whatever needs that you have, Jesus is going to be able to meet those needs. So we're going to preach about Jesus today and, and, and this, this shadow that we see in the Passover that becomes the reality in Christ. You say, well, why is that important? Well, look at John 1. When I behold the Lamb of God, when I see Jesus, I understand that my sins have been taken away. Do you understand that the only place your sins exist are in your mind? The only place that your sins exist are in your mind. God has put them in the sea of forgetfulness. God says, I will never, ever, 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 ever remember your sins. That is just this is beyond me. And, and we focus so much in the church about sins, and God says, I've let them go as if they have never been committed. That's what the word forgiveness means, aphesis in the Greek. I've let them go as if they've never been committed, and yet we focus so many times on our sins. And, and so when we begin to unveil Jesus, we see that this Jesus doesn't just cover, that this Passover lamb covered their sins for a year. Our Jesus takes away our sins. He removes them completely. 
they, they, they are not an issue anymore between you and God. Because the work that Jesus did was perfect. And it was complete. Look at 1 Corinthians 5.7. This is how interesting this is and how important this is. There, there are those of us in here today who are struggling with getting rid of the old. I don't know what that is in your life, but there's something that's holding you back. It, it might be the burden of a past sin. It might be the burden of some guilt or some shame or some condemnation. It, it, it might be a relationship that maybe you were the one that really screwed up. But he says, get rid of the old, you are new. Now, 2 Corinthians 5 echoes that same thing, but why can we do that? How is it possible to get rid of the old and become new? How is it possible to leave those things behind that we have struggled with, some of us, for years and years and years and years? And here's your answer. Because Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. There's your answer. So if I talk about nothing else other than the sacrifice of this Passover lamb today, you can be assured that part of understanding that is getting rid of the old things that have held you down. And now that you understand that this Passover lamb, this Jesus, is the reality that this Jesus has been sacrificed, you can walk into the fullness of the new creation that you are in Christ. You know, Hebrews chapter 10, it's impossible for the blood of goats and bulls to take away sins. It is impossible. Those priests never sat down. They continually offered sacrifices. In Hebrews 1, it says that Jesus sat down. And we say, well, why did Jesus sat down? Well, it's because he was the Son of God. No, it wasn't. He sat down because the sacrifice was finished. There wasn't any reason for him to stand anymore and continue to offer sacrifices. So the reason that Jesus was able to sit down was because the sacrifice was absolutely complete. And so we are made holy by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. How many times have you heard in church, well, you know what, if you just behave in this certain way, if you just do these certain things, if you pray this much, if you give this much, then you'll be made holy. Absolutely not. We, we, we believe that somehow that I'm going to continue to be more holy the better I behave. <laughs> it's impossible. The holiness is not in our nature and who we are. But through the sacrifice of Jesus, we are made holy. And we are made holy once for all time. Once for all time. Jesus has offered this sacrifice for sins, and he's offered this sacrifice for sins forever. So we're going to continue to look at Easter. We're going to continue to look at the cross over the next couple of weeks and try to figure out what does it really mean to us? Whether it's April, May, June, timeless truth here. Let's pray and we'll continue. Father, thank you so much. We just, we just come to you with great joy today, with great humility, with great love for what you have done for us. So we thank you for showing us the beauty and the truth of who you are and the beauty and the truth of what we can see in your sacrifice on this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Exodus 12.8 <clears throat> eat the lamb roasted over the fire. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water. Now, there are two people in this church right now who have seen me do something absolutely abhorrent. Absolutely something that I would hesitate to even mention in public. But they saw me eat raw sushi. sitting right here in the semi-front row. Once. It was horrendous. I, 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 I don't have any, any idea why anybody in their right mind would do that. <laughs> yeah, I know you would, Alex. It's okay. It was, it was raw.
In fact, I think Kim still probably has video of that. Ugh. So, what's the point? Well, in this Passover lamb, God told the Israelites, don't eat it raw. Don't eat it boiled. It, it needs to be cooked. So what does that mean? What do we learn from that? Well, what he's talking about is that we have a tendency in our society to make Jesus to be less than what he really is. To eat him raw, in a sense. To be able to say that he really wasn't God. He was just a good teacher. And he was a good moral person. He really lived a life that all of us should strive to live. And, and folks, we, that, that's what it means to eat the lamb raw. It, is you're taking Jesus and you're taking the sacrifice that he's made and you are equating him with a mere man. C.S. Lewis said, he's either liar, lunatic, or Lord. But you've got to make a choice. It, he, he can't be just a good person because a good person doesn't make the claims that he did. And if he made those claims and they were lies, then a liar is not a good person. If he made those claims and he really truly believed he was the Son of God, he'd have been a lunatic. So you, you can choose one of those things for Jesus, or you can choose the fact that he is Lord. There, there are no other options available to us. But we have tried to water down who Jesus Christ is. We have tried to water down who he is. We have tried to eat him raw. You know, in our, in our country today, there isn't an anti-God issue. You can talk about God as much as you want. There's an anti-Christ issue. People don't want to talk about Jesus. And when you mention that name Jesus, when you mention that name Christ, it all of a sudden changes conversations. And so we have a tendency to look at Jesus as someone who really wasn't who he said he was. And we have watered him down. We have eaten him raw. Now what's the point of all that? When Jesus hung on the cross, the fire of God's wrath fell on him. If you want to look at it this way, it cooked him. He wasn't raw anymore. And if you want to understand God, God is holy. Make no mistake. Sin has to be punished. God does, God does not exist in the same realm as sin. Sin has to be punished. For us to enter into a relationship with God, sin has to be punished. God is holy. But God also loves you deeply. And so even though sin has to be punished, he doesn't want to punish the sinner and so there had to be a solution to this. And the solution to this was Jesus Christ. Look at some of the scriptures we've put there. 1 Kings chapter 18, The Lord's fire fell and consumed the burnt offering. Jeremiah 4, My wrath will go forth like fire, and it will burn with none to quench it. Ezekiel 22, I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. So make no mistake, there was a judgment, there was a wrath, there was a fire that fell on the body of Jesus Christ. He was burned. He was cooked, in a sense. He was definitely not raw. Now take a look at your, at your um, devotional. It says that all that Jesus is before God, you are. When an Israelite brings an animal as his sin offering... He lays his hand on it before killing it. His sins are transferred to the innocent animal. The animal dies and the offerer goes free. See, so many times we, we feel like we're the ones that are being looked at. We're the ones being judged. When you brought the animal to the priest, the offerer was never examined. The animal was. 
and the animal was examined to make sure that that animal was perfect, that animal was holy, that animal was without blemish. And when that was established, which we see in the Passover, that animal then died, and what happened to us? We went free. Because the animal took the payment for our sins. So that was the sin offering. Is my sins transferred to that animal. But there was a second offering. And the second offering was called the burnt offering. Where the beauty and the worthiness and the acceptance of the unblemished animal are transferred to us. So I transfer my sins to the animal... And then the beauty of that unblemished lamb, the righteousness of that lamb was transferred to me in you. It's the divine exchange. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. So when we talk about punishment and we talk about wrath and we talk about judgment, please understand they are very, very, very real. But God doesn't want you to suffer that judgment and that wrath. The sin offering that the Israelites was never a daily offering. They didn't offer this daily. Why? Because God doesn't want you to be conscious of your sins. But the burnt offering was a morning and an evening sacrifice. The burnt offering, the transfer of the animal's righteousness to you, happen twice a day. Why? Because God wants you to be reminded of your righteousness, not of your sin. And so we see these two pictures carried out and lived out and shown out in the body of Jesus Christ. And I want to show you something that is really, really cool. And we find it in John chapter 12, and it's about this judgment and this wrath. Um, I know we've got some scriptures up here. As you look at John 12 you see that there is a judgment that's coming for the world. And this judgment of the world, Jesus says the ruler of this world is going to be cast out. Now, who's the ruler of the world that he's talking about? Satan. So there's going to be a judgment, and the ruler of this world is going to be cast out. Then Jesus says, if I am lifted up, I will draw all to myself. Now, depending on what translation you're looking at, depending on your Bible, depending on if it's literal, if it's figurative, whatever it is, you're probably going to see some additional words in there. You know, when it says, I will draw all to myself, you're probably going to see in italics or in brackets the word men or people. And so what it says in most of your Bibles is that I will draw all men or all people to myself. You with me? Do you know it's not there in the original? Men or people is not there in the original. So when you look at this in context, Jesus says now is the judgment. There's a judgment coming. There has to be sin has to be paid for. The ruler of this world, Satan, is going to be cast out. There's going to be a judgment. And if I am lifted up, where? On the cross. I am going to draw all what to myself? Judgment. The context is judgment. Are you with me? It's not men. It's not people. Jesus says, when I am lifted up on that cross... I'm going to draw all of God's judgment to myself. All of God's judgment has been put on Jesus Christ. All of it. And if you can go back and look, go back in your Greek and your linear, take a look at this, it'll bear it out. I'll show it to you if you need me to. So what we need to understand is that when God was going to, the world is going to be judged. There's no question about that. But guess what? You and I don't have to be. You and I don't have to be. It's a choice that you and I make. Are you going to accept 
this judgment that Jesus has already paid the price for you for? Did the, the Israelites had a choice. They didn't have to sacrifice that lamb. They didn't have to put the blood on the doorposts. They did that through faith based on what God had told them to do. So there is judgment. There is wrath. There is condemnation. But the Bible says that Jesus has drawn all of that judgment, all of that wrath to themselves, to himself. So some people will be judged some people will be condemned. Some people will face God's wrath, but they do not have to be. They do not have to face God's wrath. Why? Look at John three sixteen through 36. I love reading the whole thing. Um, I won't read you the whole thing today, but John three sixteen through 36, really the whole, all 20 of those verses go together. I mean, we know it, you know, God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, blah, 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 blah. It's much deeper than that when you read the whole thing. Much deeper. So when we see this in John 3, what you see is whoever believes has eternal life. Whoever does not is condemned. God says, I did not send my son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. Whoever believes has eternal life, Whoever does not, the wrath of God remains on him. So is there wrath? Yes. Is there judgment? Yes. Is there condemnation? Yes. But you don't have to receive any of it. You don't have to receive any of it. I, I, I don't... Mary had a little lamb, the message we preached a couple of weeks ago. I, I don't understand why people would not receive this. It is such good news. It's too good to be true news. But there are people out there who still would refuse to receive this sacrifice. And maybe it's pride. Maybe they don't feel like they're good enough. I, I don't know exactly what those answers might be. But you do not have to receive the wrath of God. God has provided you a way out, and people reject that way out. Look at what we find in Romans 5. You've been declared righteous by his blood. You have peace with God, and you have been saved from wrath. 1 Thessalonians, he has raised Jesus from the dead to rescue us from the coming wrath. There will be wrath. There will be judgment. There will be condemnation. But it's not God's choice that you go through any of it. He's already sent his son to draw all judgment and all wrath and all condemnation on himself. He sent his son to be receive the fires of God's judgment, to be cooked, to not be eaten raw. <laughs> and so what we see in this story of the Passover, what we see is there is so much more to it. And there is so much that God wants to give you and allow you to receive so you don't have to go through this. Part of what Jesus went through was so that you and I could receive an inheritance. There, there is no inheritance without a death. And so God says in Romans 8 that we are co-heirs with Christ. And as we are co-heirs with Christ... Jesus has come and said, okay, all of what God has given me can be yours. All of what God has given me can be yours. He says, I'm the mediator of a new covenant. Now why? So all can receive the inheritance that God has promised. doesn't want anyone to miss out on this. It says a will only goes into effect after a person's death. So one of the reasons why Jesus died on that cross was to allow you and I to receive an inheritance. You know, <laughs> there's people who will come against, I hesitate to say it because there's a negative connotation to it, but people talk sometimes about a health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. There isn't any such thing as a health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. There's only the gospel of grace. But one of the things that you find is God wants you healthy and God wants you prosperous. Why? Because you can't help people when you're flat on your back sick. You can't help people when you're broke. And so God, we, we experienced that over the last couple of weeks. 
there were other people around us that were struggling. Couldn't help them. <laughs> was so sick in my own that I, I, was, I was barely hanging on myself. And so God doesn't want us to be sick and broke. God wants us to prosper in this life. God wants us to be in health. Why? So we can help other people. That's why. So this gospel that we talk about, this gospel of grace, part of that is this inheritance that God has given us. And what we see in the midst of this Passover sacrifice is we see a picture of communion. You see them eating the roasted lamb. You see them putting the blood on the doorposts. One of the scriptures that I had been meditating on over the last week or so is in Matthew. This is the blood of the new covenant shed for the forgiveness of sins. That the blood that Jesus shed for me, it was shed for the forgiveness of my sins. That I can stand before God perfect and that I can stand before God holy. That I can stand before God righteous because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And as you see what happened throughout this communion time, throughout this roasted lamb, throughout this blood on the doorpost, look at Psalm 105. God remembers his covenant. He brought them out with silver and gold, and there were none feeble. These were millions of people in slavery for hundreds of years, and they came out after communion they came out after participating in the roasted lamb and the blood on the doorpost. They came out after that, and there was not a single person sick. Folks, that was the shadow. We have the substance. We have the reality in Christ. And so these things are so real, and it says they inherited what other people worked for. This is who your God is. This is how good your God is. And this is the picture we get of this particular story. They, they didn't do anything for those blessings. They trusted in God. And it's really cool when you look at Exodus chapter 12. It says, you must eat it dressed for travel with sandals on your feet and a staff in your hand. So what's he telling us? You must eat it dressed for travel, staff in hand, sandals ready to go. Why? He says you need an expectation of deliverance. They had an expectation of deliverance. And so, so many times we don't have that expectation. And God says, I want you to have an expectation of what I'm going to do in your life. I want you to be ready, because guess what? The time is coming for you to get out. The time is coming for you to be released from this burden. The time is coming for you to be released from the, the poor decisions that you've made. The time is coming for you to be new. And be ready for that. So let's go back to the day of the crucifixion. Remember, Passover is a picture of what God has done with Jesus. So I want to show you some things. We're going to go through them kind of slow because it's really cool. So look at Exodus 29 and Mark chapter 15. So again, the lamb is just a shadow. And as Jesus was carrying the cross, the priest was walking up the lamb, up the ramp of the burnt altar. Now the time for that was 9 o'clock in the morning. So the Jews, they offered two lambs. They offered one at 9 o'clock in the morning, and they offered one at twilight, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So at 9 o'clock in the morning, the priest was leading the lamb up the ramp of the burnt altar. At the same time, Jesus was being led to the cross. He was being led to Golgotha, led to Calvary. He was being ready to be put on this cross. So we see a picture, a shadow into the substance. The reality is coming through in Christ. Now watch this, it goes even further. Psalm 118 the Passover lamb was tied to a post with rope. Jesus, however, and Barabbas, Barabbas was chained. Why wasn't Jesus chained? Because he was a picture of this lamb. So they tied this lamb to the altar with cords, with rope. 
and they tied Jesus up and they led him away. Now, Barabbas was chained. You would think, well, why didn't they just chain Jesus? Well, they didn't chain Jesus because he was a picture of this Passover sacrifice. So everything that's happening on this day is a picture and a reality of what the Jews knew from those previous sacrifices. They were seeing this and understanding this played out. Now, when the lamb was tied to the altar, something happened. We see it in Numbers chapter 10. And it says, At the feasts, blow the shofar over the burnt offerings and the sacrifices. So when that lamb was tied up, the shofar, the trumpet, was blown. So at the same time that this lamb was tied, Jesus was also ready for sacrifice. Now at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, at twilight, the lamb was killed. And the lamb was killed, the priest would shout three words. Any guesses? It is finished. At three o'clock in the afternoon, at twilight, they would blow the shofar and they would celebrate the lamb's death. Exodus 29, offer the second lamb at twilight as a fire offering. And at 3 p.m., Jesus breathed his last and the curtain split from top to bottom. So at the exact same time that the second lamb was being sacrificed, Jesus was also saying, it is finished. And so we see this beautiful picture of the reality of Jesus in the shadow of the lamb, in the shadow of the sacrifice of Passover. Isn't that cool? Now, I want to show you a couple more quick things before we finish. When you look in your Bible and you see the word God, G-O-D in capital letters, God is Elohim. When you see Lord in capital letters, that is Jehovah or Yahweh. Jehovah is a um, more so of an English translation of Yahweh. And so when you look back in the Bible and you see Genesis 1, in the beginning, God, that is Elohim. God created. God is, um, Elohim is what he does. He creates. And so when you see that G-O-D in capital letters, this is who God is. In Genesis 2, when you see the Lord God form man out of dust, Lord there is Yahweh. It's who he is. And so we have the creator God, Elohim, and then we have the Yahweh, who he is, the personal name of God. Still with me? All right. So when you look at Hebrew, and when we look at Hebrew letters, Hebrew letters also have pictures, and they also have various meanings. And so when we take Yahweh, and when, when we write Yahweh out, it would be four particular letters. It would be Yud, which is down here, which the symbol for Yud is the hand or the arm. And then we have He, which is grace. And then you'd have another, and then Vav, which is a nail. So Yahweh, Yud, He, Vav, He. Yahweh is how the Hebrews would spell the name of God. Yud, He, Vav, He. Now when you put the pictures together, what you see is Yud is a hand, He is grace, Vav is nail. So Yud, He, Vav, He stands for hand of grace, nailed in grace. So the very name of God is hand of grace nailed in grace. Isn't that cool? Now when Pilate was putting Jesus on the cross, do you remember he put a piece of wood above him on the cross? 
Let me show you a picture of that. So you've got Hebrew up here on the top. And so what this basically says is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And the religious leaders freaked out. They said, you cannot say that. Say he claimed to be King of the Jews. And Pilate said, no, what I've written, I've written. So this is a public display of Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, for everyone to see. Now when you look at the letters, Yud, He, Vav, He. So when every single person, especially Hebrew, would have walked by that cross, they would have seen the very personal name of God, Yahweh. Yud, He, Vav, He. Pilate left no doubt, God left no doubt, that these people were crucifying the Messiah. They were crucifying Jesus Christ, the very Son of God. And that's what freaked the religious leaders out so much. Because they didn't want that. They wanted to say, hey, he claimed to be this. No, I am yud He vav He, hand of grace, nailed in grace. And so all of that just becomes this beautiful picture of the Passover lamb and what that Passover lamb has done for us. It's real. <laughs> and we see the people back then would have not missed these clues. They would have known exactly what they were doing, exactly the shadows that became reality in Christ. And so what does that show us today? It shows us today that Jesus is truly Lord. He is who he says he is. His blood has been shed. Our sins have been forgiven. And you can rejoice. You can rejoice that, that the shofar is sounding a deliverance. It's sounding a, a healing. It is sounding a protection. It is an opportunity for us that Easter that this cross was truly a new beginning for each and every one of us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, God is reconciling the world to himself, not counting our sins against us. And this is the wonderful message he has given us to share. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Lord, thank you for revealing to us today just a little bit more of who Jesus is and what he's done. The, the truth, the, the proof, if we want to look at it, Lord, that this truly was the Son of God, that this sacrifice was real, that this sacrifice made a difference, that the old is gone and the new has come. Thank you, Father, for the hand of grace that was nailed in grace. Thank you for allowing us to see the reality today. We just praise you, Father, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. I'm going to hang on up here for a little bit. If you need prayer for anything, uh, just come on up. We'll pray with you today. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a great Sunday.